Welcome to the Full Time Fantasy Podcast, presented by the Fantasy Football World Championship, home to the industry's most accurate rankings. What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Full Time Fantasy Podcast. I am your host, Adam Krautwurst, and with me again is Mr. Full Time Fantasy himself, Jody Smith. Uh, it's been a while; it's been like three weeks, man. This is before the season started. How the heck are you doing? Yeah, between uh, you know Vegas and and uh, finalizing projections and rankings and all the drafts we did, and then last week me being a little. Um, under the weather, yeah, it, it's been a while. I told you that, like, right before we went on the air, I was kind of like, man, it seems like it's been a while since we've done this. But, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm glad to, you know, jump back on and get more back into the normal routine now. Yes, sir. No, I'm excited. This is – And thank you, the- Sean, for, you know, filling in very admirably last week. Appreciate you. Yeah, Sh- Sean's always willing to do that. We had a, we, we had a good time last week, and we're going to have a good time tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about what happened week two, leading in here to week three – uh, some some exciting stuff. So everyone, throw your questions in the chat. We're happy to answer those. Start set questions, trade questions, st- stuff like that. And we will we we will get to those. But listen, first things first, Jody. Let's start with the Rams offense tonight in general. I mean, it's been kind of a surprising, not kind of a very surprising offense this year. Puka Nakua is wide receiver two. Kyron Williams running back two. Tutu Atwa wide receiver fifteen. Like. I'm not a projections guy. You are, but I'm sure you didn't have those guys ranked in those spots, right? <laughs> no. You know, the thing is with with uh, the, the Rams, the key thing is they're keeping Matt Stafford upright. He's only taken one sack all year so far, and he looks fully healthy. And yeah. after what they went through last year, you know, we're anticipating that the Rams are going to be going through a, you know, rebuild with all the draft capital they gave up over the years. You know, admittedly, I'm sure their fan base is more than happy to do so when you when the trade off is a Super Bowl title. But no, I wasn't expecting this kind of volume, and, and you know, especially from these players from the Rams, because you know, here we had uh, Tutu Atwell, you know, barely rosterable, barely draftable in any leagues, and he's actually looked good. It, you know, I think we all towards the end here started picturing that maybe Van Jefferson would kind of be that wide receiver one once we learned that Cooper Cup was going to be out. And instead, Cooper Cup actually isn't out. He's just wearing a whole different uh, version with Nakua on the back because that's how they're using him. I mean, this this usage crazy. You know, it was, it's record setting. The number of uh, passes that he's gotten in his, in his first two games. And, uh, you know, I look back and you know, I write our waiver wire and fab budget article every week and I preach to people – you don't want to be bonkers in week one. You know, that was really awesome. And, and I, you know, people tell people, hey, you know, it's a 17-week week war of attrition. Let's let's keep some of our budget. But so I think I recommended people spend, you know, one-fifth to one-quarter of their budget maybe on uh, Puka Nakua. Clearly, uh, that wasn't enough. So I hope people out there actually – disregarded that advice and were able to you know empty the coffers uh, we'll see uh hopefully cup returns to the lineup in a couple of weeks and at that point it'll be really interesting to see uh how the usage de- develops you know at this point um it feels like it's getting to the point where you know maybe we can cut ties with van jefferson but you know if, if anything um i know a lot of uh, savvy uh Fan, film and analytics guys were on Puka, so they're probably not as surprised as the rest of us might be with his usage. But to me, the most surprising thing actually has been out at, Tutu Atwell because you know he was basically, uh, like I said, not even rosterable. Now he's uh, like you said, what what wide receiver fifteen? Yeah, yeah, P- Puka. Yes, wide receiver fifteen. Puka no quit thirty nine percent target share through two weeks. Joins uh, some some incredible co- company there. Um, in the NFL, Tutu Atwell is, you know, a wide receiver two at this point. That I think Tutu will fall off. Puka is there. He looks, he looks the part. Um, you know, listen. If you recommended twenty five percent of people's budget, I mean, they still, you know, if you bid two fifty on him and you have a thousand bid dollars, I mean, you probably got him uh, in in a, in a lot, lot of leagues. People worried about Cooper Cup coming back at that point after week one. Uh, How is it going to affect um, Puka N- Nakua? So I think Puka will be fine. He'll be a wide receiver two. Once Cup comes back, I'm super excited to get Cup back even more now because Stafford looks great. The offense look, looks great. I think he's going to do really, really well. 
when he when, when he comes back. Um, uh, and then Ky- Kyron Williams, and then, then we'll get to your question, Camden. Ky- Kyron Williams, again, a guy that, you know, right now he's RB2, but, you know, he's 197 pounds, Jody. Like, if, if you got him, you're starting him, you're excited about it. But, man, you know, Cam Akers gets traded today. We'll get, in, we'll get into that. Kyron's got the backfield to himself, but, you know, 78% of the rushing attempts – 80% root, root participation. Like, can he, can he keep this up and, and stay healthy? Well, you know, that'll be the key, uh, you know, question there. Let me pull up my Ram stats here. Uh, he, he's been uh, nice. I think we all kind of targeted him as the RB uh, two, you know, the rumor yeah. that, that he, uh, you know, recency bias, I think got us on cam acres because everyone rem- forgot immediately um, that he was coming off of a, you know, bad Achilles injury and didn't do anything for more than half a season. And then, we're all remembering how he ended the season. So we all thought, okay, you know, this Kyron Williams will come in. And it was, it was clear in August that he was going to be the passing down back. And um, instead what we've seen, you know, it's complete turnaround. And obviously this week, the issues that the acres had with Sean McVay came back up. So, uh, you know, he was uh, right towards the end there. You know, I was finalizing my, my projections for the week. And all of a sudden we, we get to get, notified that uh, cam Akers is going to be inactive oh and yeah thank you uh, rams for actually announcing that early because that was an afternoon game it would have yes. killed a lot of people to have finalized our lineups with no alternate well, well off of so they announced that early so thank you again uh if you're going to do something like that let us know well jay glazer actually announced it at like 12 55 on the fox pregame show yep. i remember i just get done with my lineups you know me jody i'm doing high stakes and i just get done with my lineups i look at my phone I'm like oh my god now i have a ton of kyron williams so now i have to quick go in and throw kyron in where i can get him in where it makes sense i got him in a couple lineups thank god um but but anyways talking about <clears throat> acres as well get a question from anthony madison acres 50 50 split for the, for, for the Vikings, I think probably, like, listen, I don't think Akers is necessarily bad. I don't think he's hurt. He's passing physicals. He had a good end of the year last year. McVay just doesn't doesn't like him. Just like Swift had issues with his previous co- coaching staff, that's it. So Akers is out. Madison, people said it in the preseason. Madison isn't, isn't efficient. He's not very good. He hasn't been very good the first two games. Akers could go in there and do an immediate 50-50 split once he kind of learns, or learns this offense. So, you know, it's it, similar usage to what the Rams were, were in. Correct. I think in the Cam Akers taking more of the first and second down work and Alexander Madison being um, pencil as more of a change of pace and a third down by uh third down guy. Yeah. It's, it's a little, uh, I think frustrating, but you know, we are talking to Vikings who are passing the ball at what 80, 83% of the time so far yeah. in the first two games. Now, you know, that might be indicative of the fact that they're not successfully running the ball. So why even bother? You know, it's more of a successful plus EV move for us to just pass it on every down. And, and yeah. you know, I think from a fantasy perspective. And they're playing, we're they were playing the Eagles. Right? With that, but, uh, Sorry, you know, as bad as, as inefficient uh, as Madison has been. And remember the only reason he's even had modest fantasy stats in the week one, because he scored that touchdown and take that touchdown away. And at this point, everyone's probably, you know, cutting him from the roster. So um, I, I, you know, I still, if I, if I roster Madison, you know, at this point, you probably invested something into him. I don't want to use this, the sunk cost policy, but I'd wait a game or two and see how the splits develop. But, uh, you know, I would lean towards right now probably a little bit more into the uh, acres realm of it than it's going to be into a Madison. So maybe closer to a 55-45 type thing, maybe 60-40. But, uh, you know, and we'll, let's see. You know, this just happened today. Here it is Wednesday evening. Uh, yeah. You know, it's kind of uh, – quick turnaround for acres to even be active this week and, and I'm familiar with the playbook enough to get in there. So, you know, maybe if you're riding Madison, you give it this one more, one more game, but uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the luster is about to be gone from him. Yeah. And the other thing is too, like my, my motto is never, ever, ever cut running backs ever because they're an injury away from being the thing. So I wouldn't cut Madison, but it's probably going to be acres backfield. Uh, moving on here. We had a question from Camden about um, Jamar chase. Are either of us worried about Jamar Chase's lack of production? Uh, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm not worried about J- Jamar Chase. I'm worried about the offense. I'm worried about their all. It's, it's Joe Burrow's calf that's that yes. is the worry. And the 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 bad thing is this week is the Bengals play Monday. So there's already what rumors that that Burrow could be benched this week, or they could give him a week off to get um, 
to get right. And uh, that's a problem, obviously, from a fantasy perspective, because we may not know and you don't have an alternate at that point. So at this point, um, unless something unless there's some clarity between now and Sunday at kickoff, I would I would seriously have to consider benching Joe Burrow, picking up a streamer or something else. And at that point, obviously, yeah, um, I listed um, Jamar Chase as my wide receiver one last week. I thought that the Bengals would uh, I actually had Burrow a little bit behind his ECR. I thought, OK, what people forgot um, heading into week one when they just assumed that Super Joe was going to be back was that this he didn't have basically any practice time. He uh, hobbled off the field very early on in camp. So he didn't get that, um, you know, any of that practice reps and preseason and all that kind of stuff. And that is the formula for a quarterback starting out of the gate a little rusty. And that's exactly he was awful in week one. We saw a little bit of rebound last week. But unfortunately, it was T. Higgins who – was the main benefactor catching both of those touchdowns? Could have easily been Chase, but I don't. You know, if you watch that game, um, the Bengals were doing a pretty good job. Um, the Ravens were doing a pretty good job uh, keeping Chase blanketed and uh, making T. Higgins beat him. It's exactly what happened. So yeah, T. Higgins. Um, but you're not benching. You're not benching. I mean, it was a, it was a Jamar Chase kind of situation. You're not benching. I mean, Chase, honestly, though, right? what kind of what kind of roster did you build? Even if Jake Browning gets to start for uh, the Bengals on Monday, what kind of roster did you build that you can afford to bench Jamar Chase? I think the safe thing is you just keep trotting him out there. You just have to lower expectations until this Cincinnati offense, and it may take. You know, especially if Burrow sits out this week, then you may be looking into week five, week six before they start humming on all cylinders again. At this point, I would prefer if I am invested in the Cincinnati offense, I would actually prefer them give um, Burrow a week off if it's going to keep him closer to 100 percent down the stretch than to have him out there trying to break that 0 for 2 start, let's get out there. And if he just tweaks his calf the wrong way, then you're talking about a stint on the IR where he's missing critical four to six weeks and at that point um uh, you know that has such negative impacts on you know multiple fantasy lineups yeah no i completely agree there let burrow rest but you're obviously not benching chase just like you're not benching garrett wilson with that with the zach wilson situation the quarterback situation it stinks but you can't you can't bench your jamar taste chase the number two overall pick in the draft number three overall pick if he's healthy you're starting him um but yes I've, of course i'm worried uh moving forward um, from 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 here on out, um, Lawrence asks, "Who will back up Gus Edwards now?" I think this is in reference to Justice Hill with the toe injury. You know, I if I'm, you know, we don't still we still don't know if Justice Hill is out for this week. But if I can waivers are tonight, maybe I'm putting a dollar bid in on K- Kenyon Drake. They just signed him. He averaged four and a half yards a carry for them last season, um, uh, and so you know he would be a guy that I would certainly look at Ke- Keaton Mitchell is, is a rookie for them that's been on the IR he's a guy if you have room to stash him well, right now yeah right now their number two is going to be what Melvin Gordon but uh, you know he's but Gordon a- didn't even get, he had zero fantasy points this week I think like I don't even think right, right. yeah I mean I mean he's the only guy that that I I think is actually on the active roster right now I don't even know if he's even actually I think he is on he might be on a practice squad but they did just sign Kenyon Drake and Kenyon Drake's that kind of guy, like every year he's kind of this journeyman guy, but he gets a start or two. He gets filling in. He actually yes. has pretty productive fantasy weeks. Obviously, we can't we can't count on that right now, but I, I would be um interested in, like if we have a situation come up Friday or Saturday where you it's announced that that uh Kenyon Drake is gonna be active, it'd be like, hmm, you have to be in a really desperate shape. You have to be in a really um deep league to think about it, but you know. Stranger things, I guess, have happened, but I mean, it's all it's all looking good for Gus Edwards at this point. And like I said, uh, I'm not real excited about Melvin Gordon. Uh, you know, no. he looked like he was uh, done done last year, and uh, he hasn't, uh, you know, been able to contribute anything uh, throughout the the summer and so far two weeks into the season. And you know, uh, I, I I expect that you know heading into heading into Monday, he's penciled in as the RB two, but uh, you know, again. I wouldn't anticipate a lot of passes getting thrown to the backs this week. Yeah, Kenyon Drake reminds me of like Latavius Murray. He's always popping up all over the place. He's a certain guy that, yeah, keeps bouncing from team Bouncing to team around, to but he'll get a start. He'll score some touchdowns here and there. or get a start, whatever. Um, but, yeah, that's um, that's interesting. Um, let, let, let's, move let's move on. Let's move on to the Bears backfield, Jody. You know, uh, we had – 
Roshan Johnson and De- uh, De- De- Deontay Foreman was inactive last week. So wheels up, we thought, for De- Roshan Johnson, a little bit more work. He ended up with, you know, um, like eight yards of carry, Roshan did. But he but the expanded role went to Khalil Her- Herbert. Um, his snaps went up from 36 to 59%. Routes went up from 27 to 47%. Short yardage went from 50% to 100%. So Khalil Herbert really took over that backfield. But it's good to see that Ro- they trust Roshan as a number – two back there. And I really like Roshan. I think he's the best running back in that backfield. He's a guy that I'm holding and stashing. Cause again, we're one injury away. You spoke earlier about, listen, we're, we're, uh, you know, what type of shape do you have to be in to be looking at Gus Edwards? I mean, we're, I mean, you, the inj- every week it's three running backs down with some down for the year, some down justice Hill on a Wednesday night, like every, every day and, and running backs getting hurt. So, um, Roshan Johnson is an injury away from, I think he's really good sat behind Bijan in Texas. Uh, what are your, what are your thoughts on kind of the Chicago backfield here? Yeah. I mean, overall it's, it's, it's a backfield to avoid. You've got a lot of turmoil coming out of Chicago at this point, offensively, uh, you know, the quarterbacks, Justin Fields isn't getting it done either on the ground or through the air. What was really odd last week was uh, Deontay Foreman who hasn't been terrible by, by any regards, but uh, he was a healthy scratch last week. So yeah, sure. We all boosted Roshan thinking, this is going to be weak. Instead, it was Khalil Herbert who was a little bit more involved last week. But uh, I, I still think it feels like eventually that this is going to be Roshan Johnson's backfield. I, I think obviously the the Bears are the kind of team that's going to keep a committee involved, and obviously Justin Fields will will most likely lead the team in rushing anyway. But Roshan Johnson was really, really good at Texas. He just got outshined by playing behind this Bijan Robinson guy. But I think <laughs> if, if it wasn't for that, uh, Roshan Johnson, you know, had a chance to be, uh, you know, a top, top three, top five running back in that class. And he's got a three down skill set. He can do everything. We've seen a little bit of that. He's actually leading the Bears' backfield in target share. You know, and fantasy points per per snap and fantasy opportunities. Uh, I think he's got the most upside. He's turning in the right direction, but uh, you know, until we see uh, that emerge, you know, it's hard to view uh, either him or Herbert as anything more than like a desperation flex play that you just kind of hope that this, you know, they, they break off a 18 or 21 yard touchdown. I hope it's this guy, not the other one. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. Moving on to another, uh, Kind of NFC North back to Jameer, Jameer Gibbs, Detroit. Is this is this Gibbs week? Is this breakout week for him? Week one, he didn't get a lot of playing time. Looked great on Thursday night football. Watching that out out in Vegas at the at Circa, that was incredible with all the FFWC guys. Then week two, he doesn't you know he doesn't get as much as we would have hoped. But what we get the injury um, there to uh, David Montgomery. So now is it wheels up here for for, for, for Jameer Gibbs? I have him in the top twelve running backs this week, facing the Falcons at home on that fast turf. Um, you know, can we get a, can we get a Jameer Gibbs week here? I would hope so, but this is, listen, I have had him around my top 12 each of the last two weeks and we've seen the same usage. It's almost like they just got a new DeAndre Swift and they're just refusing to uh, allow him to take over and all that. He's had seven carries in both games. Um, even after David Montgomery exited last week, it's not like they just started giving him a lot of carries. I mean, at that point, game flow kind of dictated it was a passing game. I mean, you'd love to see the the, the target uh, usage yeah. of Gibbs. He's got a 16.7% target share at this point, which, you know, that's a good thing to see. But And that's um, probably going to go up with, with Montgomery out. But Well, you're hoping so, but, you know, they'll – you know, at this point, though, um, Gibbs has one red zone touch the entire season. That's two weeks now. Um, that feels problematic because they that's an area where at least through the air they were using DeAndre Swift last year. At least like once a game he would get at least a target or, a, you know, a touch at that point. So far, two games in. Again, it's just two games. But um, no – he's got one red zone carry. He went for zero yards and no targets. That's um, – not being targeted in the red zone for a running back that has the skill set Jamar Gibbs has is very problematic. That that like uh, really peaks the fantasy upside and potential there. Um, so we're looking after, for that this week. Is, is that what you're saying? We got to look and see that. No, see, week. here's the thing. 
Adam, as you know, uh, I'm a projections and a numbers guy, and I've twice in a row here, I've went to the well thinking that I had Gibbs as my RB12 or 14 in both of these games, uh, especially last week. We um, we we saw uh, the last couple times that the uh, Seahawks and Lions played, we've been track meet. So it was a perfect script for Gibbs Goff, and we didn't see it happen. Even with the usage uh, down the stretch after Montgomery exited the game, he still was, you know, just okay. He got a bunch of dump off passes and all that, maybe salvaged his uh, value a little bit in PPR. So you think as a projections and rankings guru, um, okay, two weeks in a row, I, I, I've got to lay off Gibbs. And, of course, if I did that, it's exactly where he's going to break two touchdowns this week. Uh. So I'm going to leave him a, about where he is. Um, I think Craig Reynolds has the sneaky potential to, uh, you know, kind of take over that Montgomery role a little bit in a game that has, you know, a lot of uh, pr- the higher over-under like this game. Uh, you know, I'm not saying pick up Reynolds and insert him into your lineup, but he – does have a little bit of value in leagues where you know, if you're desperate for running back and, you know, the way Adam, as you've mentioned a couple times, the way they keep falling off um, and Zon of a night, uh, I believe he'll probably be active for this game, but uh, you know, I don't know that, that, that he'll be all that involved, but uh, I'm willing to, you know, I think at this point uh, I'm going to leave Gibbs in my lineup at least one more week. Uh, and this is the anticipation of, of uh, okay. Without Montgomery, if he can't step up, and break a long touchdown or uh, get more than seven, 10 carries in this game. We can re we can re look at it, say heading into week four, but I, I think um, I'd be willing to say, if you're asking me, is this Gibbs week? Sure. I, I, let's give it one more week. Like I said, I've learned over the years. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't, uh, don't jump off too early. The Falcons have the number 23 ranked defense against running backs. Um, We've been David Montgomery injury. Like this is when you draft a Gibbs. This is what you were waiting for. It's time. Don't bet. Don't go away from Gibbs yet. Uh, I'm excited for a, for a Jameer Gibbs week. Very similar to something that happened last week with Deandre Swift gets the injury, gets his opportunity. Absolutely smashes shocker. Um, all of us kind of saw this thing coming. Like, man, Deandre Swift is so good. I hope, hope Deuce Staley was watching this game because he kept him in the doghouse for two years in Detroit. Um, what did you think about Swift? Can he hold on? I mean, obviously, I'm sure you loved what you saw, but Absolutely. can he hold on to this role when Kenny Gainwell comes? I have out? Swift. I have Swift everywhere. Like every team I'm on probably has the under Swift. So that you know that was a great performance last week. If anything, I uh, I underestimated him. Um, they used him like a true legitimate you know, feature back. I know we all knew the narrative coming into the season that the Eagles threw the, the fewest passes in the league to running backs. And uh, that was the problem with Swift. But um, let's keep in mind, as great as he looked as a runner last week, forget, forget that he looked good as a receiver and pass protection and whatnot. He looked like a legitimate, um, he looked like a, a Reggie Bush type um, Reggie Bush after he stopped being utilized as, as you know, the, the, the pre Alvin Kamara, when he actually started being featured in Miami and in Detroit as a legitimate running back. I thought that's what um, Swift looked a lot like last week. And it was really, really encouraging to see of course. However, remember Kenny Gainwell was out in that game. And if Gainwell is able to suit back up, uh, you know, that's going to throw a wrench into potential plans because wouldn't it be just like the fantasy gods to be like, all right, we got us that the, the feature DeAndre Swift just like we want, and for the, the, the team to go back and uh go right back to to the game well in his uh 3.9, 4.1 yards per carry and all that. It, it would be frustrating. I think this is a smart uh Shane Steichen's a little smarter than that. Uh, um, maybe a little bit of a one two punch situation there might be in, in order but uh i loved what i saw out of, out of swift and uh i think the most maybe the most damning thing is that remember rashad penny who a lot of people were saying i'm not taking swift i'm just going to get discounts with i'm going to take rashad penny in round 12 or you know 14 or whatever <laughs> like clearly the team has no confidence in him whatsoever he was a healthy scratch in the first week and then last week um when every opportunity could have come for him to uh you know, work his way into a 50 50 split or whatever. We saw Swift completely take over the backfield. Uh, Rashad Penny uh, barely did anything with the limited touches she's got. So at this point, um, if you're still holding on to 
Rashad Penny hoping that he'll get an opportunity. I think it's about time for you to go. He's uh, at this point, he's clearly even behind Boston Scott, I think on the pecking order. So I, I don't see any reason to hold on to Penny <laughs> any longer. Yeah. Well, again, I don't cut running backs, but you're right. Penny's an interesting one because like, what are you waiting for? Right? I mean, how many injuries away is Penny now? Three injuries away from getting into the game. So I, I totally get you there. Um, what scares me about Philly is they're not a, they've shown the first two weeks. They're not going to just rotate backs. They're going to have their backs and they're going to use the one back and keep the others in reserve. Week one, it was Kenny Gainwell. Swift did nothing. Penny was inactive. Uh, week two, it was all Gainwell was hurt. It was all Swift. Penny did, did did nothing. Boston Scott came in before Penny when Swift need, needed a break. So what's scary is if Gainwell comes back, do they go back to Gainwell and Swift gets nothing? I can't see them doing that. I'm, I can't bench uh, Swift after the game he just had. He looked no. awesome. He looked nope. awesome. Yeah, nope. I'm, I'm nobody's, sure nobody's, nobody's benching Swift. It, like I said, it, it, it's potentially a little concerning that if – the club decides to get smart and go and, and keep get cute and go back to uh gain well, but I, I don't see after Swift put up a hundred something yards and a touchdown yeah. for you and was terrific in all facets of the game. I don't yes. see how, how you do that. And like I said, this is a smart team. The only the only situation uh you know with, with Swift's usage will be that, that his touchdown numbers will be a little bit less than we'd like to see on, on any other team that wasn't using the quarterback to punch in all those short yardage touchdowns. But hey, if he can even play at uh, two thirds to three quarters of what he was last week, then he's going to be, you know, borderline RB one, RB two for the rest of the season. And I'm all here for that because I've loved Deandre Swift. I remember, I remember, even in Detroit, who they couldn't have, they couldn't have been in any more of a hurry to get rid of him. All three seasons in Detroit, uh, he was an RB two or better in fantasy points per touch, fantasy yeah. points per game, and all that. And I think he's more than capable. And he proved last week that he can be that and more. Yeah, no, I, I I completely agree. Question from James Maloney. I love this question. When do we go with team RB? So instead of drafting running backs, hmm. you draft the team and you get all the running backs. I love that. I've been screaming about that. I mean, can you really do it in high stakes? No. Can you do it in home leagues? Sure. But I love the idea. I mean, there are, Jody, there are so many injuries to the running back position. It's all, I don't even have Nick Chubb anywhere because I was taking receivers high. You know why? Because running backs always get hurt. But even the running backs you took later on, J.K. Dobbins, done. It doesn't matter. These guys are elite athletes. They're always getting hurt. Justice Hill, toe in practice. Christian Watson, he's not a running back. Hamstring, out for a month. Deontay Johnson, hamstring, seeing a month. Like The injuries these guys get in practice is just elite athletes. Like What are, what are we doing about these backfields? I played in a home league where it was team running back and you got the running back points for that team, for that, for, for, for that game. I love that, that idea. If you can incorporate that into the home league, it just takes, I don't know. It's not as fun. It's not as strategic, but it takes a lot of the luck out of it from drafting the, you know, from, from losing your running backs. I mean, if you had like Chubb and Dobbins, your season's over. I don't care. Grind the, grind the waivers. You're not, you, you're not getting Nick Chubb back. You're not getting JK Dobbins back on waivers. It's a mess. What do you think about team running back, Jody? Well, I hate it. <laughs> I mean, it takes a lot of the fun out of it. It completely, to me, it completely <laughs> it devalues individualism and, and it completely changes its draft strategy and all that. I mean, I'm an old sure. school guy. Sure. I get it, you know, from a certain, uh, you know, standpoint. Like maybe in a best ball format, it might be something that's that's reliable. I mean, I mean, relatable. But, um, you know, at that point, if, if someone were to explore that in their home league, you know, at, at, at what point do you just go with all teams and just do best ball drafts and just get it over with me? Um, How about all flexes? Dealing with, dealing with attrition and, 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 you know, throughout a season and being being able to be predictive and, and get out ahead of things. I mean, nothing to me feels uh, as – I don't know what's, what, what word I'm looking for, but Re -re -re rewarding. When you're a week rewarding. ahead, uh, yeah. when you're a week ahead of a, a, a potential waiver claim or a potential injury and all that, you're like, mm, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and uh, get out ahead of this, and then something happens. It, it just feels so good because you, you don't have to worry about getting outbid by a guy and, and eleven other managers having that opportunity. But I get it. No, I get it. It's I, just, I don't. I, again, you know it. I don't know how, uh, like team running back. I mean, at that point, um, wouldn't it devalue wide receivers? Because then, you know, wouldn't teams, you know, uh, as you were drafting, um, 
you know, it, it just opens the door. Like we know some years coming into situations like teams going to be bad. Like we knew the Cardinals were going to be terrible this year. We projected that, that, uh, you know, the Texans, the bears, the bucks were all going to be bad. It hasn't necessarily played out that way, but you know, three of those teams have, have been pretty crusty so far. So, you know, at that point, uh, and, and if you're doing a, a team backfield, I mean, doing something like, you know, you get in around three of a draft, you know, why should I take this stud wide receiver? I can just take Texans backfield and that's going to assure me like, you know, right. Uh, no, I get that it. team going to rush for 1200 yards and, you know, eight to 10 scores. I mean, you do the math, like that's better than a wide receiver two or three at this point. But right again, you know, I think, I think a smart compromise would be for um, us as a industry to start maybe, um, you know, remember the offset of uh, PPR started in, in the mid to late nineties when running backs were dominating a, everything when, when LaDainian Tomlinson was outscoring even yeah. the elite quarterbacks every week. And if you had a, um, you know, if you happen to have gotten a, a LaDainian Tomlinson and a Larry Johnson in your lineup back in, you know, the, the late nineties, well, if, if you were that lucky, nobody could beat you. So, you know, we as an industry looked for ways to even out things for wide receivers. Well, fast forward 20, 20 plus years. Um, it's a whole different, facet now all these teams are uh, built like track teams they're going out there they're flinging a ball everywhere if anything we should look for a, a a new scoring system i don't know if points per carry would be something that that we could offset scott fish is great about be being very proactive with scoring for the scott fish bowl and uh, trying very diligently to get things evenly distributed between all positions and i think maybe as an industry someone smarter adam than you and i can come through with a situation that, that can that can weigh the uh, the attrition of running backs the the lack of depth the fact that even uh even the professional teams aren't valuing running backs you look at the whole contract situation with jonathan taylor yeah maybe as an industry somebody smarter than you and i can come through and think of the situation how can we balance things can we can we go to three running backs to two wide receiver backfields can we go to a a point per carry or a point per first down where that would swing uh balance back to running back scoring i'm all for it because i'm an old school guy i love uh securing uh, those those uh running backs early and uh, taking my chances with receivers listen late. you're you're, you're talking about adding more running backs and adding more scoring. I'm, I'm talking about there's no running backs left. <laughs> like we should just make them all flex flex players. It's it's just getting well, you know if you get to a, you know a situation where you know PPR obviously favors wide receivers. So if we had a PPC where we got rid of you know right. so hypothetically, um, what what is PPR now? What's actually points per carry? Well, then a a Justice Hill. Uh, actually has legitimate value because he's going to get in. He's going to get me 10 or 12 touches, but um, you know, Hey, at least, uh, at least I can count on that five or six points that he's going to get yeah. me that way. And Hey, if he breaks one for 10, 20 yards and all that, well then, you know, he'll pay off his, his value at that point. I don't know what the answers are. It's not something I'd, I would care to, um, you know, dig too much into it. It would yeah. be a really, really fun. I think off season article for someone, a data scientist to uh, crunch some numbers and come up with something for us. But I mean, yeah, I think something could, you know, should be done moving forward. I don't know if uh, team backfield uh, sounds too easy, but uh, you yeah. know, maybe, maybe there is something in, in, you know, the idea of taking back our backs. Yeah. Taking back our backs. I like it. Back. You know, what was that? What was that song? About? Return of the Mac. Who was that? <laughs> was it by Mike Evans? Because we're going to talk about Mike Evans next. This, the guy is rejuvenated, 30 years old, 20% target share. Come on. Um, I'm sorry, 28% target share over his first two games, 47% air yard share, and a 70 yard. You know, Jody, I had multiple rosters last week with Mike Evans and Traylon Burks, two guys who caught 70 yard passes and couldn't get in the end zone on those, on those passes. Like, come on, guys. What the heck? Um, but he looks great. Uh, him and him and Baker Mayfield are cooking together. That's all we want out of Baker Mayfield, the Jimmy Garoppolo, the Baker Mayfield, just the guy that the Brock Purdy, the guys who can get the ball to the playmakers and let them cook Zach Wilson, please, God, please. Um, and so what do you think of Mike Evans moving forward? Is this a fluke? Are you, are you projecting him higher? Well, what do you think? I think he's a, he's been a really nice value so far. You gotta love that 28.1% target share. That's, that's been the key so far. Um, you know, to me, the concern is not him as you know, he's playing in a contract year, uh, obviously wants to strike a big, 
Um, to me, the concern is is the pumpkin with uh, Baker Mayfield. Is he going to continue to play out of his head, and, and or are we going to see the same situation that we've seen time after time with him, where eventually teams, uh, you know, figure out a way uh, to stop him, and at that point, the offense kind of erodes. And uh, so far, this team is exceeding expectations. I love it because um, I thought that uh, I want to say Mike Evans' uh, ADP was like in the wide receiver 30 to 35 range in the summer to me. His track record of excellence, I mean, every season, 1,000 yards. I think he's got, what, eight straight to start his career or something like that. I mean, I was like, man, <laughs> he's such a value. I have a lot of my teams. I have a lot of Chris Godwin who I thought was going too late and Mike Evans. Cause again, I mean, you don't, I didn't feel good in July and August building teams centered around them, but Hey, you know, so far two weeks in um, both have, have played out of their heads. I mean, way better than I was anticipating, but again, like I said, um, like if we could do a crystal ball at him, like we knew that, that Baker Mayfield makes 16, 17 starts for Tampa uh, ends the season with, uh, you know, close to 4,000 passing yards and 24 touchdowns. So in other words, he actually ends up being a, a credible quarterback. Well, I'd, I'd hesitate to say that shit, you know, if that were to happen, Mike Evans is probably going to approach 1,300 yards and uh, double digit eight to 10 touchdowns. And he's going to be like, you know, in the fantasy MVP uh, seasonal at the end of the in this season award talk, because like, again, you know, he was going so late at that point. So uh, just enjoy it while you can. Cause like I said, it, it can, it can, things can change fast. Uh, you have to worry about, you know, Baker Mayfield. I don't want to keep, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the, uh, the insults and things that he took and, and maybe he's got his head on straight finally and all that. But uh, he also made a, uh, a derogatory comment the other day about the Astros. So I'm kind of, upset with him. <laughs> he's, a, he's a OU guy so I would expect nothing less that's right that's right don't be hating on him um all right so move, moving forward let's go over a couple a couple of start sits here and then, and then we'll get out of here a couple of guys that maybe are on the kind of the, the the borderline or maybe some guys that we're just dropping a little bit in our rankings a guy that a, a guy that I'm I'm really high on this week a guy I'm starting and most people are anyways but a guy that I really like is maybe even a borderline wide receiver one this week is a is a is a young man although he's not that young named Tyler Lockett for Seattle facing Carolina the number 32 ranked defense against receivers you can't get worse than that or I can't get better than that for a guy like Tyler Lockett so he's a guy that might be a your wide receiver three or flex I think you should be confident and starting a guy like Ty, it's Tyler Lockett this week, and maybe even a DFS play here. What, what, what do you think, Jody? Oh, Tyler Lockett is outplaying his ADP so far. Who would have thought that? Who would have thought? Yeah, it hadn't happened like eight consecutive years or anything. <laughs> another thing, another thing you think about in that game is uh, what happened to Bryce Young. He uh, he didn't play. He didn't practice today. So that's uh, yeah. you know, that's another thing that's not going to uh, potentially work out too well for the for the Panthers but uh could get ugly there yeah I love I I you know I I like Tyler Lockett I like DK Metcalf um you know I I thought that uh Geno Smith was going to be um I didn't want to say that he was so I didn't think could repeat last year but to me it seemed awfully suspicious that this guy was such a um journeyman for 10 12 years whatever he's been in the league and then all of a sudden just went crazy last year out of nowhere and then you know gets a little bit of money and now he's good but so far through two games now we saw a little bit of of uh 2022 mm -hmm. geno smith last week in detroit that was a fun game so uh we'll see this week in a in a in a game that won't be near as near as much as a track meet but is all, in all like you just said adam a, you know much better matchup you know for the seattle offense we'll see how he does but uh yeah yeah he, he's got if you got him you're obviously starting him every week yeah yeah you love it a guy that's it's another guy that's been okay this season and a guy that was kind of drafted later on, James Conner. Um, you know, he's been a RB2 this season, but he, he, you know, he's home against Dallas this week in a game that could be an absolute boat race. Dallas, I think, is double digit favorites here. Um, I would, if you can afford to do it, I know there's so many running backs hurt and you probably, you might have to do it. But if you can afford to, to bench James Conner, I would do that. I know he catches the ball, but this could be another one of those Dallas against the Giants games from week one where it's just a complete – they blow everything up. Nothing works. Um, and so Conner's a guy that I'm leaning towards benching this week, even if I have him. Uh, 
you'd have to have avoided all these injuries so far and have a pretty loaded backfield, I think, to afford benching James Conner. Absolutely understand what you're saying with the Cowboys. I don't want nothing to do with playing against Dallas if I can avoid it. But, you know, you're looking at a guy that's uh, RB12 on the season, I think, so far, and he doesn't have a touchdown yet. Uh, 78% snap share is crazy. He's uh, 43.4% utilized rate. That's uh, really, really high. He's got 10% yeah. target share on the team. <laughs> Almost 70% of the rushes for the backfield. He's being totally uh, – this is a feature back right here. So really hard to project. You know, James Conner, um, he's staying in on third downs. He's staying in, in on, on the red zone. He's staying in on uh, come from behind mode. He's catching passes. And that's where in a game um, – Assuming Dallas is ahead by double digits, um, Connor staying probably in the game even into the third quarter, so he's still racking up volume. So um, I'm not saying you can't bitch James Connor. That's totally dependent on your team. If you struck gold with a couple of late round running backs, if you got a Kyron Williams, right? And, um, you know, in waivers, or you drafted him late, and that's your RB two, and and you can flex a wide out by all means, go with the you know go with the best players. But I think the vast majority of us are going to have to. You know, go ahead and keep sticking with it because okay, uh, quick, quick ones here. Ready, James yeah. Connor or Gus Edwards? Uh, I'm going with Connor just on a sheer uh volume, you know, James I'll Connor or Raheem Mostert against the Denver. Um, I'd probably go with with Mostert because the way that that uh Miami is temporarily using uh, uh Mostert, uh, nobody else has really stepped up, and I don't know if De Devin Achain is ready to really take on more of that field. So I feel like it's the same thing there. Uh, you know, just a much better offense. Yeah, no, I I, I definitely agree agree with that one. Right, let's talk a little bit. Of, uh, we got a question about Kendrick Bourne. This is probably a this is from Anthony. Maybe a start sit question. For Kendrick Bourne, I don't know if you have your rankings up, Jody, but what, what's your? I mean, ton of air yards the first the first, first two week for Bourne. Um, where do you have him in your rank? I, I lean still towards benching Kendrick Bourne. I, my team is usually very receiver heavy, though. I draft a lot of receivers, so um, Bourne would need bye weeks or injuries generally to get into my lineup. Uh, where, where do you got Bourne this this week, Jody? Yeah, I think the, I think the problem for. Um... You know, oh, the Jets. Last week, yeah. Devon, Devontae Parker came back and kind of like became the wide receiver one and really took a little bit of that luster off. And yeah, this week, uh, you're talking about a potential offensive struggle in this game, a, a pretty low scoring uh, yeah. down. It's going to depend on, uh, you know, who the who the Jets. I don't think that they'll shadow. They don't need to at this point, but uh, it's a pretty bad matchup overall um, for you know, the New England offense. And, you know, you could say the same thing about the, the, uh, the Jets offense too. So uh, it would depend on who your options are, but I, you know, I wouldn't go out of my way to feel like I, I need to start born this week. I mean, to no, me, I, more of a, um, you know, he's a guy that uh, that will probably come out um, when I, when I start up, uh, I'll publish my personal rankings, uh, you know, tomorrow he'll probably come out in that wide receiver 50 to 60 range. Yeah. Point, that's where you're starting to, uh, Tell your um, tell people that these are guys you probably you know don't necessarily need to start, but these are guys that, that basically should be be considered flyers. Yeah, completely agree. I mean, he's their number. I don't even necessarily know if he's their number one. Devontae Parker might be that guy. The Jets matchup is couldn't be worse. I mean, the Jets uh, secondary is so good. I mean, I'm starting even guys like KJ Osborne over him, Rashid Shaheed. I'm gonna look at, uh, Sean's uh, initial Jayden Reed. Sean's yeah. initial predictions are right on what I just said. They have him at uh, he's got him at wide receiver sixty five. So yeah, exactly. So I'm definitely benching benching Bourne this week. Um, let's move on to quarterback here, Jordan. That's, I mean, it's it's been tough sledding for a lot of these elite quarterbacks early on. You know, Lamar has, has hasn't looked great. Josh Allen didn't look great week one. Got back on the. Got back on it week two, but Anthony, you know, a guy like Anthony Richardson, who's a guy I was drafting everywhere, um, a guy we talked about a ton, Jody, in the uh, in the preseason. You know, if he plays this week, I don't know what that. Do you practice today? I don't know. I didn't see the reports. No. He, probably, he probably didn't. No, he's still, other... he's still in the protocol, which I think, um, you know, there's still time for him to get cleared. But but I would start suggesting at, at this point that uh, you know Gardner Minshew is going to start taking the, the lion's share of starter reps at this point. They did say today that the, they don't anticipate running Richardson any less. Apparently what happened was uh, he hit his head on the turf on the second TD run. And that's yeah. too bad because, you know, he had already rushed for two touchdowns in the second quarter of that game. Yeah. So he was on his well on his way to post in top three 
uh, oh, fantasy points. 40. He was and, putting up 40, Jody. He was putting up 40, that stinking game. He, he very well could have. And uh, he apparently self-reported that he was feeling some symptoms afterwards. So, uh, yeah. Well, I, I, out of respect for the young man, I, I'm glad that he, that he did that. These guys have got to uh, be more um, aware of these kind of situations. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that the team – you know, because a different time of the NFL that would, would yeah. really went that way. And, it, and it, I hope I, you know, for him and for my fantasy teams, I hope they let him sit a week. Let him sit a week. Let's get let's get back. You saw what happened when you start too early, man. Tua last year it might have ruined his whole career. He might get, you know, he he might never never last. Uh, he could only take one more hit, Tua, and that could be it for him. But I got I like a guy like Brock Purdy to kind of take over if you have an Anthony Richardson issue, man. Brock Purdy on a game, Thursday night game. You know, he's got so many weapons. It's at home against the Giants who have kind of just for six quarters are completely inept against like the Cardinals were terrible. Even that, that game too. So gave up, you know, 20 high twenties to to the Cardinals. I like Brock Purdy to come out tomorrow Mm -hmm. and really light them up. So he's a guy that you can kind of put in there too. Um, in a in a, in a really in a really nice matchup, and Russell Wilson, another guy that you can flex play into that quarterback if you need a a streamer. Dolphins uh, secondary without their top um, without their top corner, and which has to be a shootout there. Um, I can see Russell Wilson again. He hasn't been great. The Broncos offense has not been great, but Judy's back, and I think just in garbage time, even Russell Wilson can put up three touchdowns. They were just fine last week. Right, that's right. Thank God. I mean, he did throw he did throw a hail mary last week, but you know, who's counting it all? It all counts. It all, it all counts. But um, all right, listen, great show tonight, Jody. Did some start sits, answered some questions. Um, really good time, man. Uh, I like you. What do you got coming out this week? You got your personal rankings coming out tomorrow. I have a start sit article coming out tomorrow at some point. Uh, what do you got going? Uh, just published my Thursday night preview. You've gotten both uh, both games so far this season correct. So I made my uh, best bet for that game. Uh, you know, of course, I wrote it starting last night. So the line moved. Uh, it's probably fixing to move in, in the uh, other direction now that we know Saquon's out. But um, I'll have my personal rankings posted at some t- point tomorrow. And then I'll start working on Sean's uh, DFS content. So this is the uh, the busy days of the week are now, uh, you know, Wednesday through Friday and whatnot. So um, that's right. And then we're getting ready for, um, before we know it, tomorrow night, more football. Right. Week three, let, let's go. So, all right, everyone, thank, thanks, thanks for joining us. Uh, on behalf of myself and Full-Time Fantasy, this is the Full-Time Fantasy Podcast, and I will see you next week.